This morning, as we gather for our worship service, there are certain people who've asked for, our, for prayer uh, from our congregation. And I want to share some with you. You may have another uh, that you want, might feel compelled to add, uh, and we'll do that. The only problem is we have to do it from in here. Our people over in the auditorium uh, have no way of contacting me for this. We received a call this morning that Dwayne Weatherington is in very much need of our prayers. Many of you know that Shea Mission is named for his daughter, and uh, he's in the hospital over in, over in uh, uh, Albany with heart attack and with COVID. So we'll be, need to be praying for him. Miss Sue Ball obviously needs our prayers, and so do Don and Linda Roberts and Shirley. Shirley was able to come, and Stacy, who is able to be here, uh, with their in own individual health problems that they're facing. We want to add Sue and Buddy Taylor. Uh, Buddy uh, is uh, in much need of our prayer, but Sue is too, very much so. Uh, we want to pray for Steve Tucker's sister. Uh, she was getting better last Sunday, if you remember, and things were better. We prayed for Faye Thompson last Sunday, and she, and, uh, and she is uh, uh, doing fairly well, and we want to continue to pray for her as she goes through uh, her uh, surgeries and, and, and whatnot. Now, I left some out, I know, and you may have somebody you want to put on there, and if you do, we'll do that right quickly. Anybody? Okay. Uh, one of our deacons is now going to lead us in prayer. Our Father, we are grateful that we can come to your house. Father, we see the times that we're in, and we realize more, more and more that we need you more in our lives. We just thank you, Lord, that you've been with us the whole time. And that uh, we know that you have, and it makes us feel more secure. We pray for our world. We pray for the United States of America. We pray for Crossland Baptist Church and each and every one that's associated with it. Now, we just thank you for the opportunity we have just to bring our cares and our needs to you. Because we realize, Lord, that you care and that you're going to answer our prayers according to your will. We just thank you for this opportunity of being in your house. And we just thank you, Lord, that, that uh, we're continuing as we are and asking, Lord, that you might help to get a vaccine for this virus and to get us back to normal. We continue to, uh, to pray and depend on you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Because of the COVID, we cannot are asked not to sing in our church services. But we can all, with our mask on, read the words of Amazing Grace as it's played for us. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed.
through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. They brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. An amazing, beautiful presentation of God's grace and our faith in that grace. I want to return to the book of Ruth. We, we looked last Sunday at the uh, opening of the book. It's a short story if you put it in literary genre, uh, but it's a story that it deals with life and a large swath of the life of Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. I want to, uh, to share the verses 3 through 7 today. If you remember, the first two verses talk about Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons leaving the home place and going to a foreign country during a time of famine. While they were there, <clears throat> Elimelech died. Then Malin and Chilion, who had married, uh, who had married girls from Moab, died also. Naomi lost her husband and her two sons. You and I don't understand fully what she was going through because we have social security to help us. They had nothing except the boys that they birthed to take care of them in old age. Naomi had nobody except the two daughters-in-law. Listen to this further uh, furtherance of the story. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malin and Kilian died, also both of them. And the woman was left, with her, left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had blessed his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return unto the land of Judah. Now this may, my idea of what's happening here, may have arisen in my heart from the fact that I lost a grandson, then I lost a son, then I lost a wife, and then I lost a daughter. Those things wear on a person. But you and I can look for the fact that sooner or later we are all going to go through a grief experience. And let's not forget that any significant loss results in grief. It doesn't have to be somebody's death. It can be the loss of a job. It could be, it could be the loss of a dear, dear friend that turns their back upon us. 
You see, there is in the process of grief some things that all of us must recognize. We must recognize, I think, that there are, there's going to be psychological and physiological reactions that are going to occur in the loss of a significant relationship. <clears throat> Naomi experienced great grief. She left her homeland, which was a time of grief. She left, was left, lost her husband, which was a time of grief. She lost two sons, which was a time of grief. She knew firsthand the trauma of grief. Now, grief is not a very po popular subject for a sermon, but I want you to understand something wonderful about it. But because of its inevitability and because of grief's universality, I think it needs to be examined. And when we examine it, Naomi's grief can help us. Now, I want you to look at the first thing, the enormous hurt that's caused by grief. And there is hurt that's caused by grief. Whenever grief comes, hurt follows. Any way you look at it. The deeper the relationship, the deeper the hurt is going to be. Elimelech, Naomi's companion, died. Later, her two sons died. And I'm going to say to you, there is no closer tie that exists than a spouse and children. When you lose those things, there's something going on inside of you that you have to deal with. Naomi knew that great hurt that's caused by grief. Now, grief hurts physiologically. That means in the body. It does. Those of you who've experienced grief can understand that and will know what I'm talking about because bereaved people suffer a tightness in the throat that they can't help. Sometimes they can't talk because of that. They, are, they will have sometimes shortness of breath that's going to happen inside the body. Sometimes they just sigh for nothing. You can't find a reason, and there it is. It's a, huh, it comes. There's loss of sleep that happens. That's physiological when you're dealing with grief. But then there's also a psychological problem with bereavement. You feel lonely. Lonely. I can't, I won't ever forget an experience that I had that I really didn't understand. My brother Paul was pastor at Eastside Baptist Church. He had a group of ladies there who had lost their husbands, either by grief or by divorce. And they met, and they wanted somebody to come to, to, to talk with them. And so Paul asked me if I would go to talk with them. I didn't realize the hurt that people have, the emotional feeling of loneliness that occurs at that point. I can go now since all my, the losses of, that I have, and I can sympathize with those ladies. At that point, I couldn't. I didn't know that loneliness because I had someone I could come home to at night. I could put my arms around her. We could talk together. But then all of a sudden, those arms were gone. That talking was over. And I was lonely. And if you've lost a loved one, you know what I'm talking about. But there's also some despondency that, approach, that, that attends it. Whenever that loved one is put away, you get to the point, well, what's the use? You become so despondent, 
You have to motivate yourself to go back to work. You have to motivate yourself to, to be a part of the family again. You have to come from deep within. And then there's anxiety on top of all of that that comes and causes you. And fear. What's going to happen to me? I know that I never locked the doors at the house. My wife, when I went to bed, Jackie would have to come by, come behind me and lock it. I just didn't do that. I, I didn't have that fear. And you know something? After she left, I realized that door's open. I got up the next morning, opened the door. The door was open. And I'd slept all night long with that door. I'm going to tell you, it didn't take long for a little. Well, what if somebody comes in here and knocks me in the head? It didn't take me long to realize that I had left the door unlocked and it could be my responsibility to lock the door. But I'm going to tell you something else. That even though there are a lot of other emotional re reactions, I think that the best way to describe grief is simply it hurts. It hurts. When Nandy died, my grandson, I learned that phrase. There was a lady who sent me a card, sent Jackie and me a card. And in it, she started, my heart hurts. And that's exactly what happens. When death comes, my heart hurts. And that has become a part of what I say to people who are hurt. My heart hurts for you. And it does. You can feel that pain that's in the heart. And I'm sure that when Naomi realized that she was here in a foreign country with only daughters who didn't work outside the home except as, as they could in poverty. For you're going to find later on, Ruth worked outside the home. I'm sure that her heart hurt. But there's something else, too, about grief. And that's the necessary expression for it. How much Naomi expressed her grief is not known. We don't know how often she did it. We do know that in the ancient world, grief was loud and strong. People heard it, and they heard it a long time. They saw it, and they saw it for a long time. In Jesus' day, People grieved by keening. That's what they heard. Time after time for a loved one. They keened. They even hired keeners in order to express their grief. We don't know it. It was long. It lasted a year. They wore armbands. For a year, and you've seen some people do that yourself. Here where we are. They cried, they lamented, and most important of all, they told others about their loss. You know, one of the things that I used to do, I, after, particularly after I'd lost my grandson, I realized how much I needed to talk. But you know, there's some people who don't like to listen to people talk about death and about their loss and about their grief. They don't. How did I find that out? Both of my children came down with a neurological de degeneration that caused them to go down, 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 down. I knew people didn't want to listen to me. I knew they didn't want to hear about my problems, the problem that I had. And so I kept my mouth shut about them. But you know what God did for me? And he'll do it for you. Every once in a while, when you are about to explode, somebody comes up to you and they say, 
how are you young'uns doing? And you know they're sincere. And you spill all your guts. It doesn't get any better than that when you listen as somebody hurts and they can say it. I can remember that as vividly as if it were today. When God would send somebody that I knew would be interested in hearing me talk. Whenever somebody needs to talk to you about the death of a loved one, if you are a kind and wonderful Christian friend, you will let them spill it. They need to spill it. And you'll let them Spill it to you. We want to hide our suffering. We want to block our grief because we feel like the other people may be having greater, greater grief than what we have. <clears throat> There's one wise person who said in China, if you don't weep outwardly, you will weep in inwardly. And I finally found out when I cried a lot in the pulpit, as you may well know, that there's no need to apologize for that. Because that's God cleansing our soul. He uses our tears to do that. But then there's another thing. And that's the importance of other people during our grief. Naomi had closed out had a close relationship, rather, with her two daughters-in-law. And without a doubt, they were a great source for the relief that she could find and feel because of those two, uh, those two girls. But God, who is the most significant other in your life or any other life, was an important source for Naomi. She was living in a time when people felt like God ruled only in the place where he was worshipped. They might find themselves worshipping Molech in this country because that country is where Molech lived. Or they might worship Baal because in this country is where Baal lived. They might worship Jehovah because in Israel Jehovah lived. But God has no boundaries upon himself. He does not do that. Many times, I'm sure she told her heart, her hurts to God. And she doubtless asked for God's strength from time to time. But companions on earth also help during our grief time. People who are here where we live and where we work can give us, give us moments of relief from our grief. Hours upon hours of talking can do something to help our grief. And Naomi's daughters, daughters-in-law loved her, and they listened. Now, but later on, we're going to show you how, how much they loved her. They were willing to leave their homeland and go with their mother-in-law into a foreign country. And you're going to see that in a little bit. So why don't you extrapolate the meaning of that back into Moab where it all started. And those two girls listened to Naomi, their mother-in-law, time after time after time after time. That's what we need sometimes. We need someone time after time after time. The need, there's a need though, and this is something that happens to get beyond grief. I don't think that Naomi ever forgot her husband and her two sons. I don't think she did. But she is something, one thing she did realize, and that is that you have to move on from where you are. 
You've got to move on. I want to read this verse again, verse 6. Y'all listen to it again. And then I want to make a practical application to it to my life. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. Went forth with her. <clears throat> when I was 29 years old, I had the greatest trauma, first trauma, that anybody could have. My mom and dad went with Jackie and me to Athens. We were looking for a, an apartment for the two of us and our, and Andy, to, uh, Benny rather, to live in there. Jackie was expecting, uh, expecting Beverly at the time. And Daddy had grown up just south of Athens at Bishop. He had a little route, a little milk route that he ran when he was a boy. And we went back to Athens, and he wanted to go and see how things changed or had, had remained the same. So we went. We had a wonderful time because Daddy enjoyed showing us where things were, and he saw all the changes that had taken place in Athens. I don't know if he went there now, he would never be able to recognize that spot because I don't recognize it whenever I go through there when I lived there for two years to go to school. But we got home that night. I left Benny. We left Benny with uh, Mom and Daddy. They wanted to let him spend the night with them. He did that sometimes. Four years old he was. And uh, we went home. We went over to Ms. Miller's house. And there we stayed with Mr. and Ms. Miller. Went to a party for cookware. And we bought cookware. And we were happy. We got something that we could live. We still use it, by the way. We got something we could cook with and live with and and we were happy, and I came in the door, and I headed straight to the bathroom, as people have to do sometimes. And when, when I got in there, the telephone rang, and I heard Ms. Miller say, oh, no. And what had happened was that my daddy had died. I mean, died just like that. That was the greatest shock. I ever had in my life. We had to, that was, on a, that was on a Friday. I had to preach on Sunday at Dixie. We had to do all the funeral arrangements and everything on Saturday. We had to get ready for a funeral on Monday. And I had to preach on Sunday. I'm going to tell you what I did. I looked in my head, myself. My daddy was one of, I, he was, for me, the person I leaned on. And I thought, and what would daddy want me to do? And it came to me, he'd want me to go preach and do my job because life goes on. He'd said that so many times to me. I appreciate that from my daddy. Because it was advice that was well needed. Life goes on. You have got to keep going because life goes on. You live in all that grief, but you go on. That's what Naomi did. Naomi moved on. Did she move on with joy? No. Because you know what she wanted to do with her name when she got back? Naomi means pleasant. And when she got back, she said, don't call me Naomi anymore to her old friends. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because life has been bitter to me. But she moved on. And in that moving, she could find that there was life beyond her. 
She sensed that life had meaning for her beyond her grief. Now, going beyond grief means incorporating the, as the aspects of, the in of our deceased loved one's uh, traits in so into our own lives. As I was doing, did with my daddy, my daddy's trait was, you got to go on. you got to go on. And that's exactly what happened in my life. It means establishing new relationships. And it means discovering new meanings for life. And I've told you over and over again, God blessed me with another woman when my wife left me. God blessed me. You grieve, you don't forget. <laughs> I still call her Jackie sometimes. You don't forget, but you go on. You go on. When loss comes, we shall need all the help we can get to get beyond it. Don't ever forget that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, in the office of the Holy Spirit, is the greatest help you can ever have to deal with with grief. You'll never forget that person. And you don't want to because they've been a part of your life. They meant something to you. But God is making, as I said in one, here in one sermon to y'all one time, God is making a quilt out of your life and he takes all those rugged things and he puts cotton on them and sews base up on the bottom of it a shield and so you become a beautiful quilt, and that's what he's doing with all your sorrows, with all your anxieties, with all your cares. God, in the words of Peter, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Bow your heads with me, please. Dear Father, how good it is to be in your church today. How good it is to meet with people who believe that Jesus Christ is your son and that he wrote, was, has arisen from the grave. And Father, in our faith with that, we depend upon your grace to be sufficient for us. I pray for those who have lost loved ones. And there's not a person in this building who has not lost someone that they love. And some of them recently, recently. I think about those little Roberts young'uns over in the auditorium on the side. And I think about the fact that their granddaddy is gone. And I pray that you would give them grace. But I pray for all of us here in this auditorium that you would give us grace to meet and match the life that is ahead. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.